All right. So welcome everyone. Um, some of you whom I can see and some I cannot, but welcome to this first, um, the first resilience in research for the fall semester. Uh, this is, as some of you are familiar, this is an opportunity for you all to come to learn about uh, resources, uh, institute centers on campus um, and learn about potential collaborative opportunities. Uh, this is not so much a focus on individual studies or the real of the science as such, but more about the work that's being done. So hopefully you all might uh, reach out to some of our speakers over time and develop collaborations. So it is my uh, distinct pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Amit Sheth, uh, who is, um, describes himself as an educator, researcher, and entrepreneur. He is the founding director of the university-wide AI Institute here at the uh, university. He is a fellow of several organizations, but I've been given only the abbreviations and I'm afraid that I would not know what all those abbreviations all stand for. I will leave that to Dr. Sheth. He is uh, listed among the top 50 computer scientists in the US, so a distinct um, group. Uh, and he has co-founded five different uh, companies that pioneer technology similar to what is found today in Google semantic search and knowledge graph. Um, and he's also developed Cognovi Labs, which is at the intersection of emotion and AI. And mm -hmm. he has mentored 45 different PhD advisees and postdocs in academia, industry, research, and entrepreneurs. Uh, just for people to know, Dr. Sheth does collaborate with some faculty here already at the college, but there are several um, new faculty who have joined and may, and um, I think it would be of great interest to hear what Dr. Sheth and his group are doing. So welcome, Dr. Sheth. I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Maradin. Uh, let me uh, share, my, share my screen. Uh, so uh, this is the AI Institute website. Um, AIISC.ai. So AI I is AI Institute, SC South Kenna.ai. And um, uh, we're just talking uh, about our facilities. We have exceptional facility. Uh, you know, you have some kind of pictures, uh, very wonderful collaborative spaces, uh, our own um, uh, 50 person uh, seminar room, and, uh, you know, other conference rooms and uh, things of that nature. So um, with that, uh, I'm planning to give you a broad overview of the kind of things we do and, um, oops, uh, why is it shared? Okay, yeah. So I hope you're able to uh, see my slides and um, kind of focus on just one of the several um, major themes that are happening in the health space. So. The AI Institute um, has grown very fast. I moved here in 2019 uh, with the uh, with, with six of my uh, PhD and postdocs, and um, uh, we are now uh, more than six faculty, and uh, we, are, we are six faculty and more than 30 researchers. Um, and um, as you see, so this is something very distinct about us, particularly our collaborative work. And um, I'll focus on this one uh, particular component of the health related things we call augmented personalized health, uh, something that improves the life of the individual patient. Now, so we are, we are the first uh, university-wide AI institute in the US Southeast. Uh, since we started, some other universities have made even bigger investment in AI institutes. So I would have liked to say we are the largest. It's hard to proclaim that or be clear about it. Uh, like Florida, for example, have $60 million of investment. So, um, so I'm not sure where we compete, but um, we, we are really, um, you know, one very important thing is that we do core AI research, but at the same time, we do a lot of translational research. So clinical or digital and digital health, public health, epidemiology, pharma, nursing, and many other areas, manufacturing, education, that's, um, uh, you know, going on. Uh, this is one slide that uh, gives you uh, an overview of the uh, both the technical and applied part of the AI students in the center. You see some of the hmm. major themes in AI, which I don't plan to cover in this talk or this conversation today. Uh, and outside you see um, uh, several of these areas that we have 
um, uh, existing projects in. Uh, so in each of these, I think practically all of these have um, coll collaborators uh, on, on, the, on this campus. Um, um, he, this is a, uh, you know, again, um, list of um, topics and uh, you can find corresponding colleges in the department. And, uh, you know, large number of these are collaborative projects, as you can see. Uh, neuroscience, cognitive science is a growing area. Clinical and uh, personalized medicine is the largest area. This is just a uh, subset of the... Um, collaborators in the clinical and health space. Uh, so you can see uh, from your college, uh, two of them are listed, uh, but uh, there are you know, more than these, uh, but these are the things that are going on rather in a robust manner. Um, we have a, um, you know, again, uh, in the digital health area and public health area, uh, these are some of the collaborations, uh, including those uh, from outside. Uh, there are a lot of projects. Uh, this is a subset of projects uh, that I think these are all health related projects, uh, health, public health related projects. So you can see uh, you know, quickly from the title and asthma, pediatric type one diabetes, mental health and such. Uh, these are the ones in which we have uh, collaboration with nursing. Um, we deal with a very broad type of healthcare data, electronic medical data, uh, electronic medical records, social media data, conversations, uh, you know, patient clinician, uh, also virtual health assistants, uh, and patient generated data, including variable sensor and uh, app generated data, images such as food, fMRI. And we use a broad variety of AI techniques and technologies. Um, and that does include a lot of devices and internet of things and you know, medical devices also. Um, now, uh, medical conditions and health challenges that we address are uh, uh, quite a large number, uh, asthma, mental health, addiction, COVID-19, CVD, uh, type 1 diabetes, adult uh, diabetes and hypertension, neutropenia, sleep disorders, and several other broad issues like uh, uh, gender and race disparity, drug design, and other things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, uh, I'll just talk about um, two items, as I said, augmented personalized health and automated uh, clinical assessment. So let's look at um, augmented personalized health. And if you are interested, um, you can have a copy of this presentation. Uh, there are a lot of links in this uh, presentation that link to additional talks and videos and uh, you know uh, papers. Uh, so, what is augmented personalized health? Um, the idea here is to uh, look at um, assisting patients in managing their care, and uh, one where in essentially it's all about patient empowerment. So, this thing you know more than I. Uh, you know, since the um, affordable care and all the emphasis on uh, patient empowerment has continued to increase. And um, within that context, uh, patients should be able to monitor themselves. So this is about collecting the data, like your Fitbit that collects your data. Uh, then, um, or, you know, or, or you have an ECG or you have something else, you know, that, that gives you just data. Uh, the self appraisal is to uh, map that data to understand the disease uh, status or condition. So you want to be able to interpret that, and that is self appraisal. Self management is uh, think about a patient with a chronic um, health condition, and uh, you know the patient sees the doctor every three or six months, and uh, there is a discharge summary, and basically. Um, the patient and doctor have come to an agreement that uh, this is how you're going to manage your disease. Now, how are you going to manage it over the three to six months before you see the doctor again? Uh, and how do you know how well you are doing with regard, you know, day to day? Think about, let's say, depression. It can change every day uh, or, or hypertension for that matter. Um, so uh, 
how you are doing and what adjustment you need to make subject to uh, already identified plan. So you're not doing new diagnostics per se, uh, you know, because of regulation, other purposes. Um, we we leave it that we leave that to clinicians uh, or your consultation of clinicians. Uh, but uh, within the specified plan, how do you keep up with it? And that is self management. Intervene is when uh, things are uh, you know again in a chronic uh, health uh, condition, uh, uh, chronic uh, disease. Uh, things go wrong from time to time, and you need to call up the doctor. Uh, you you things are not within the specified limit that you had planned. And so you need to say, well, uh, I'm not keeping as well as I need to, and you need to get an intervention. So how do you get that? And then the last thing is this is progression and tracking. So this is uh, the, the schema I had uh, defined a while ago and uh, written about, and then uh, this has been instantiated for several diseases, several medical conditions. So, um, you know, in this particular implementation, what happens is that uh, you have a broad variety of, um, if you see on the bottom left, uh, you know, your broad variety of data. That, and often this is data, a patient generated data. It could be also an extraction of clinical data. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, for example, a patient gets a copy of his own uh, EMR data or discharge summary, and it can be there too. Uh, it can be your sleep beat and uh, you know sleep monitoring device and all that kind of stuff. Um, you have the knowledge of the medical domain, so you see the top right, uh, you know, left uh, top uh, knowledge domain, and 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 what happened? What there is a term here called personalized knowledge graph. So there is a concept that um, we uh, uh, the system, the AI system that we develop, continuously keep tracks of your uh, you know clinically relevant conditions uh, and it continues to change so it essentially is a structured representation of um, um, your condition you know that you need to monitor longitudinally right so uh, for example if i'm using a chatbot as a way of collecting and engaging with the patient then all the conversation that happen uh, you know, one month ago, one week ago, yesterday, and now, they all being converted into a graph that is visualizable, that can be visualized, and that is easy to understand as to, you know, what has, uh, what has patient told to the system, and what does it mean, and uh, what is the current condition. And all that goes into, and then there are a whole bunch of AI techniques, uh, natural language processing and understanding, uh, deep learning, and so on and so forth. All of that help with this uh, augmented personalized health, the, the five stages uh, uh, and levels of capabilities. I talk about this more in a TEDx talk that I gave earlier. Let me start with first use case. Uh, this is of uh, asthma. So in this um, uh, project that I had with uh, Dayton um, Children's Hospital, uh, we had consented 200 uh, pediatric patients from seven to 17 years uh, and um, we had created a mobile app and um, uh, a bunch of um, sensors that would connect with the mobile app on a tablet and collect data plus also collect data from the web. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, today's pollen uh, or, or uh, you know, air quality and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, we had um, Fitbit for sleep and activity. We had click flow meter or for FEV1 and PF, we had um, a questionnaire, uh, we had indoor air quality measurement, we had clinical note, uh, clinical note abstract. So there were 29 different parameters that we were collecting continuously. Over one single day, we could collect as much as uh, 1,852 data points per patient per day. And uh, you know what we are trying to do is to uh, change from episodic to continuous monitoring, clinic centric to patient centric, clinician control to patient empowered, disease focus to wellness focus, parse data to multiple big data. You guys are all very well aware of all these uh, you know, buzzwords, but here you can see uh, a concrete implementation of, of uh, all these things. Uh, I can discuss more detail if you have time. Um, so um, when you collect all the data, 
for individual patient, you are able to, uh, for example, visualize the data in this particular way. Uh, for a particular, you can look at by day, you can look at over the period of days, you are able to look at, uh, you know, um, correlations. Uh, they may not be causes, causes but there will be correlations. Uh, and, um, you know, so oh, it looks like there is a connection between pollen and, um, uh, you know, and, and symptoms. Uh, so, and then you can dig further. Um, so here is an example. So what we did is was we ended up developing a digital phenotype score, uh, which, uh, and we compared that to asthma control test score. So the doctor would conduct a asthma control test whenever they see the patient, but uh, that would be once every six months or so. Here we have the capacity to revalidate uh, a digital phenotype score every day because with all the new data that we um, collect and give you an instantaneous uh, reading of that. And um, you know, uh, here the graph on the right say shows a reasonable, uh, you know, uh, like uh, proximity between the two, reasonable uh, correlation between the two uh, measures. Uh, so we thought we we claimed and we published a you know literature that you know showed that we think uh, that the, why we think um, the digital phenotype that we developed uh, is is a, a good proxy for a summer control test and how it could be used. So um, there was this uh, paper: How use my child's asthma, digital phenotype, and external insights for pediatric asthma. Um, uh, then uh, you know. Uh, we want uh, the self appraisal of, with the digital phenotype score. So um, you want to be able to uh, understand how am I doing, right? And um, something that, um, you know, the data is not that meaningful, uh, but you need to convert that into something that uh, allows uh, a parent of a child to say, well, how, how is my child doing or day or day? And uh, I'll pass all these details. And um, uh, we had also published on this personalized health knowledge graph, which I talked about earlier. Now, in this study, what we did was to uh, look at the patient or, uh, you know, uh, patients were consented for either one month or three month studies. And that's a quite a bit of, uh, you know, think about the evaluation it takes uh, to a patient of which we were successful in getting uh, adequate data uh, from 150 of them. Uh, so, you know, the other 50 kind of dropped out or did not, uh, some malfunction happened or whatever, which is routine. Uh, and here, uh, you are able to analyze the data uh, over the period of time. This is a population level analysis saying, in the spring, what se seemed to be the most, uh, you know, the significant correlation, and you can see pollen is pretty strong, uh, you know, uh, a, f a reason for for uh, symptoms in the fall it looks like uh, you know uh, the pm 2.5 for example had a very um, uh, you know strong impact um, uh, and as did pollen uh, so uh, uh, and, and in august to mid october range so um, uh, so things change the reasons uh, why um, there are symptoms uh, change over the period of time. Summer has a different uh, dynamics. Then we also looked at across the uh, two different symptoms when uh, uh, you know, uh, we collected data across them and how do things change. So that is then uh, you know, discussed in one of the publications where you know, personalized asthma trigger. So the interesting thing here is that this could now allow um, each individual patient to be able to be, be, to be mindful as to what, um, you know, uh, could lead to uh, a trigger, well, you know, the triggers that could possibly affect the asthma. Uh, an example could be that a, um, uh, a, a child, um, you know, 10-year-old uh, is applying to go out today, but um, there's a very high pollen count. And we already know from the past history um, that uh, this particular uh, child is, um, uh, 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 you know, so, uh, has had um, strong correlation between uh, pollen and 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 uh, symptoms. Uh, so then you want to advise the child uh, either not to go out or you go out take your rescue medication with you. Uh, there are many other things that I won't discuss in detail, but. One of the very important thing was adherence, where um, 
there are a lot of situations we found where, uh, you know, in the uh, clinical uh, context, the uh, child or patient, uh, uh, adult, adult uh, parent uh, would not bring out any adherence issue. But uh, looking at the application collected data, the doctor can easily see that the child was not uh, compliant on controller medication and can, can clearly see that when the child uh, slacked off on control medication, um, there there was uh, you know higher symptom symptoms, higher number of symptoms, and uh, now you can show to the you know uh, parent that look this this compliance is much imp more important. Otherwise, you'll have to take more rest medications and all that other thing. So you can really engage and uh, lead to a better decision making. And here, uh, you know, evidence based path uh, to personalization. Uh, you know, so uh, they, here we are able to show for individual uh, patients, uh, a patient, patient A was monitored for 13 weeks, encompassing uh, winter to spring, and his asthma type was severe, uh, and he had low medication compliance, and uh, you were able to see uh, the absence of pollen, uh, the impact of uh, PM 2.5, uh, and uh, presence of pollen and uh, impact uh, of both, uh, you know, um, pollen and PM 2.5. And you can see the asthma episodes, uh, you know, go up uh, and how the things are correlated. So this can give you very uh, individualized um, uh, insights. Now we also created a mobile app, but then we created a chatbot. And it's a very comprehensive chatbot and um, this shows you the uh, kind of a plan uh, for conversation, uh, depending upon the particular patient's, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, asthma management of very poorly controlled to not well controlled to well controlled. And, um, you know, how we uh, uh, could construct a personalized conversation with the patients. Uh, here is just one example where um, you are able to create a very personalized conversation. Uh, here, um, uh, you, are, you know, you say, well, what is the weather? Uh, and the weather is good. And that's what your Alexa or uh, Google Assistant will tell you, or Siri will tell you. But here, this could say, but rabbit pollen is high, which does not look good for your asthma condition. And then you can, you know, make personalized conversations. Are you planning to go out? Yes, I am. And then you are going to look at, on the right-hand side, what kind of reasoning happens. And then says, uh, you know, do carry out rescue medication before heading out kind of stuff, right? So if, if, if an assistant that really understands you and helps you make those choices. So there is a pretty long video I won't be able to go through, but, um, you know, that shows you uh, this chatbot. Okay, I'm going to pass that. The next one is, an, next example is that of personalized uh, precision nutrition, a very big, uh, I think uh, there's a lot of interest in this, uh, you know, both in technology world and in medicine. And in particular, uh, you know, we are working with, uh, you know, one of um, uh, CON members uh, uh, on type one diabetes. So um, this is a pretty sophisticated application where uh, you need nutrition knowledge, uh, you need uh, understanding of what patient is eating, uh, and that is a, not a challenging thing. Uh, patient can uh, input that in different ways, including taking a photograph, understanding the photograph, uh, and what is on the plate is not an easy thing. And then all of that lead to further deeper understanding of cooking methods and all that stuff, and then come up with a personalized um, you know, recommendation and why the patient should eat or not eat what is on the plate uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, using a variety of knowledge um, and then uh, tying it with the, um, uh, you know, carbohydrate um, uh, management uh, that the patient, that patient has to follow uh, is, is what we are trying to do here. And, you know, this just gives you insight of how you can make this, how intelligent this application is. So if the recipe is, slow cooker chicken and white bean stew, uh, then it see the system understands you, you can eat it, it's it has healthy uh, carbohydrate, uh, unhealthy carbohydrate, cooking method, uh, and all those things are uh, understood. If it is potato fries, well, 
uh, potato carbohydrate is fine, but it's the cooking method, frying, which is, uh, you know, in, 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 introduces unhealthy fat. Or cheesecake, again, added sugar, right? Uh, and uh, there's a lot of things be going on behind this, this thing. But here is a, you know, there's an application that has been developed. And this is the food logging part of it, where you can log uh, manually. But you can also uh, take a photograph. And uh, when you take a photograph, um, you try to understand what is on the plate here. It found three things. And it says what it found. And um, uh, the patient can change because this application cannot uh, be 100% accurate in understanding the image. So it can be changed. And there are multiple ways a patient can say um, application can be calculated estimate, uh, application calculated estimate without image, and uh, he, a patient can submit his or her own estimates. And there is a video of, of a demo here, which again, I don't have, I was planning to show the videos, but I realized I just won't have time. So there's a video uh, that shows how this works, and uh, you'll have an access to this uh, a bit later on. Next is a, a pretty significant uh, work that we are doing. Uh, this is with the ABC uh, uh, project, the, one of the largest projects on our campus is Adult, Adult Brain Collaborative. Uh, Julius Fredrickson is uh, leading this project. Uh, and there is a large team in public health. Uh, and um, uh, here, um, uh, the, the, they have a cohort of 800 patients. Uh, patients are called <laughs> for a meeting. Um, uh, there's a test, image test, where patient uh, is shown images, patients uh, speaks, data is captured, uh, speech is captured, uh, text is captured on a form, and uh, all the data collection is there, plus uh, somebody has to sit down and do the scoring. Uh, scoring can lead to, let's say, a, a Montreal um, uh, uh, MOCA score. Um, so the scoring is very common everywhere in medicine uh, for, uh, for depression will be PSQ9, for anxiety it may be GAD7, and so on and so forth, right? But this thing about collecting the data from the patient and analyzing the data is uh, everywhere. Uh, the other applications, aphasia, autism, mental health. So we are developing the platform that makes um, uh, these, both of these data collection and data uh, you know, uh, uh, analysis uh, automated. Uh, so this one um, uh, you know, uh, has a, um, you know, you know you are, you are, there are many reasons why you're studying it. And uh, this, this is a very informative video uh, that if you are interested, please look at it. Uh, and uh, you know, what we are trying to do here is um, uh, this particular slide. Uh, that we want to say, can we predict cognitive impact, impairment or decline using language features? What is the relationship between cognition, language, and brain health in, in normal aging? What language factors related to brain health can act as predictors for cognitive decline in healthy older adults? How can natural language understanding uh, uh, help create models of language prediction that may predict changes in cognition, language, and brain health? So there is a lot of um, you know work that goes on here, uh, which I won't go into, but uh, you can see the uh, you know all the kind of data involved here, which is pretty extensive, right? Um, and uh, you can uh, you know here is the the test that I was talking about. So this narrative discourse test and uh, you know and uh, Montreal cognitive assessment, and these are the pictures and you know uh, the, the uh, uh, patients are, uh, so there's a lot of things that you uh, learn from this short-term memory, uh, visual spatial ability, exit functions. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I don't know, let's see if he's going to play. So, so uh, I, I, I think the video is not, uh, I, 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 here's a, a capture of actual uh, voice samples uh, and uh, we do speech analysis, we do uh, natural language processing. So, you know, I'll just skip to um, uh, various things here. So, you know, you can see the text processing, there are a lot of things that go behind the text processing. So all this is being done. 
And um, uh, let's see. So, okay. Um, so that is the ABC AI project um, that's going on with uh, Julius Fredrickson's team. Um, the next is um, a whole bunch of work we are done in clinical interviews and conversations. So this can be done for assessment or diagnosis. Um, uh, day to day, for example, assessment of your mental health. It could be done for triaging. Uh, you know, uh, today a nurse practitioner would uh, talk to. Hold on a second. The stupid. Uh, Okay, sorry. Um, and then um, uh, self management maintenance I mentioned, social support. Um, for example, um, a patient may uh, have a, a social circle and connecting to those circle and getting help from them. All of this can be done. So uh, we have a pretty uh, comprehensive work going on with the mental health chatbot. And um, you know, many of the current mental health applications are very rudimentary and um, uh, we're not sure, you know, there's, there's, they're, some of them are popular, but they are far from, uh, you know, what you might call clinical scent. Uh, and um, there are a lot of things involved in ensuring that um, uh, you can converse with the patient in a um, um, comprehensive that, that 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 captures and understands really what patients are trying to do, do it in a natural way, keep the patient engaged, and uh, keep the patient safe. So um, many of the applications um, use something called large language models using deep learning, uh, but the, it has been shown that these agent chatbots have a lot of uh, downside. Uh, in one example, uh, in conversation, um, uh, the you know, human said, should I commit suicide? And the chatbot says, yes, you should. So this kind of stuff, um, uh, and there's a lot more nuanced things that you have to worry about. For example, um, you need to understand the limitations. Uh, we decided that we, suppose we decide that we want to keep the conversation only to the mild and medium size of uh, type of mental health condition. Uh, that we want to avoid uh, conversing about uh, anything about, let's say, uh, suicidal thoughts. And go, if, if the, if the uh, if, because, because you just don't want the, uh, you just technology uh, to manage uh, more severe conditions of the patient. So how do you make sure that um, uh, uh, you are within that safety environment, safe environment uh, where you do want to be able to use the chatbot, but don't go to the other environment uh, where it will be unsafe. Uh, so th there are things of that nature that which we also work on. Um, there's, uh, I'll, I'll go through a lot of details here, uh, but... Um, okay, so um, uh, the, the, the other things are... Um, uh, uh, a doctor and a patient has um, a conversation uh, uh, during one uh, session. And the next time the patient comes after three or six months, a uh, doctor wants to be reminded of um, uh, what was uh, discussed last time. Uh, we got hold of actual real world conversations in that database and average length of conversation was 56 sentences. Now a doctor doesn't have time to read through 56, uh, you know, uh, uh, sentence worth of uh, thing. So here in this case, we uh, created diagnostic interview summaries. And, um, uh, you know, uh, so here is the paper, knowledge infused abstractive summarization of clinical diagnosis um, interviews. Um, we use something called knowledge graph. Another very important area is explainability. So whenever we want to, whenever we use AI system, uh, many of the AI systems are so-called black box. That has significantly impeded um, 
clinical acceptance. Uh, so we are developing uh, brown, uh, you know, gray boxes or, or white box solutions where we can explain how the AI system came to whatever conclusion or choices that um, it has come to. So uh, before clinician would accept uh, an AI system's help, uh, it, a clinician could uh, or nurse could see why um, there is such a suggestion being made before acting upon it and can record those things. And these are very important things for many, many reasons. Um, uh, here is a, uh, you know, there's a very interesting chatbot um, uh, which uh, 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 is uh, being developed. And uh, uh, here's a conversation that is uh, pretty, um, uh, so the, the interesting thing here is that the chatbots that we develop uh, are driven by medical knowledge. In this particular case, example, we have a medical clinical guideline uh, built around uh, PSQ-9. And the, the whole conversation process and the whole understanding process is being driven by these nine considerations. And so we are, it's not, you know, so we are essentially, you know, following what's actually in the DSM-5. And, 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 you know, and we can show you how we are adhering to medical knowledge and, uh, you know, keeping the things accordingly. This was a past project that we did. We invested a lot of effort in this healthy game cough application. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, uh, there was a very uh, comprehensive application for uh, uh, COVID-19 that was developed. And um, it was, we had a very big plan. Um, uh, and I think, you know, you can see a lot of things that was done for that. And it's, uh, um, you know, the, it was on the um, app store and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a status check you could do and all those kind of stuff. Um, but unfortunately, um, there were operational issues uh, in, uh, you know, and legal issues, uh, which uh, basically did not allow us to do the uh, very wide scale deployment that we had uh, initially planned to do that. So sometimes it's not the technology or what we can do technically and otherwise. And, um, you know, Sara, um, from uh, Donewart, for example, and others uh, from, from CON spent a lot of time in giving us the requirements and we spent a lot of time in deploying it, but uh, that uh, ultimately uh, wasn't deployed for various reasons. And I won't take too much time here, but I have to discuss more. Uh, and then there are uh, things here uh, about Reddit. Uh, people go to social media all the time. Nowadays, uh, they go to web search engine all the times for medical health. And there are many, um, you know, challenges here. Uh, so, for example, how do you connect somebody who is looking for help to somebody who is knowledgeable um, and clinical, uh, and ensure that the help uh, is being provided that is clinically uh, uh, appropriate uh, kind of thing. So uh, we we develop things along that line. There is extensive work in uh, addiction related research that we did. Um, uh, Another uh, very interesting um, uh, work we did, and so we did a statewide monitoring uh, in Ohio about uh, patients, uh, people talking about suicide ideation or uh, <clears throat> other, other things. Uh, now, uh, last one probably that I'll mention, or maybe a couple of more I'll say, but is a system we developed uh, called Sacademy. And uh, this is uh, how does, this is a public health study. And this is about uh, how mental health, uh, addiction, and gender violations are associated with things related to uh, COVID-19 or pandemic. So what happens here is that uh, with the pandemic, um, there are a lot of things happen, right? Um, public health uh, policy choices or political policy, policy choices. <clears throat> you close the school, you uh, close the workplace, you provide aid, you, um, you know, you have um, testing policy, you provide, you know, um, people lose jobs. Uh, all these have implication in uh, what happened. And uh, all of you are aware that um, uh, population suffered quite a bit in terms of mental health in, in particular, also in addiction. And uh, so we define empirically something called social quality index that is based on this. 
and um, uh, you know uh, try to understand the connection between policy choices. Certain states uh, try to keep the uh, state open; others uh, try to uh, you know make the choices uh, to reduce the number of uh, deaths. So those choices were there, and then but what they have, it's, they, both of them were very complex, right? Uh, uh, and and so we uh, try to understand that. Now we analyze massive amount of data. We had um, uh, se uh, seven billion, you know, twelve billion tweets, for example. We had seven hundred thousand articles, and um, uh, you know, from all that, and we did statewide uh, analysis, uh, and we can uh, look at uh, uh, from week to week to week how the things are changing in the state in terms of this addiction and mental health issue. And uh, we can uh, connect with the data we collect as to the choices, policy choices those uh, states made. And we, uh, so you can, uh, you know, look at here in this case, um, frequency of depression, addiction, anxiety kind of stuff in individual states and how they change over the period of time. And some states had, um, you know, this, the, you know, uh, situation that was worsening other states as situations that was improving or they went up and went down. And there is a, a video that describes this in, in more detail. And um, uh, uh, I won't uh, go through that. Um, there is another uh, problem of um, uh, matching uh, support seekers with support providers. Uh, so that's a very interesting thing where on Reddit, uh, how do you, there are not enough editors to ensure uh, that a, some, somebody who's asking a question will be uh, connected with somebody who has a, a good answer. So how do you uh, make that match kind of stuff that, so there is this work along that line. So um, um, I know I, you know I went through this very fast and I have a lot of videos and that I did not go through. Uh, but instead of playing them, and I don't know who will be interested in what, uh, I welcome you to uh, review these videos on your own uh, when you're interested. And um, um, right now, I can just take the questions uh, you may have. And, uh, you know, we can have conversations uh, uh, that might be more better. Uh, thank you, Amit. <clears throat> it's a fascinating presentation covering so many different health conditions, different populations, different questions. <clears throat> Let me open it up to the um, uh, folks who are attending. I cannot see you all, so you may want to just unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. So in the absence of a question, let me get started. Uh, Amit, how best, uh, you know, given that you've worked with different peoples and, and different disciplines and different places, uh, how, uh, what are the characteristics of what works well for you all in terms of potential collaborations? How do people get started? And what have you found in your experience to work out well for interdisciplinary Very, very good question. Very good question. I wanted to discuss this. Uh, 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 any case, so um, we are in the AI Institute, and um, uh, there are two things at the minimum we want to do in anything we do. A, uh, we want to take up a project where um, it is uh, technically demanding, where the role of AI uh, makes uh, a difference in the solutions we are going to get. For example, we are, we are going to, um, uh, uh, you know, let's say, suppose we deploy the mental health uh, chatbot and uh, thousands of, and hundreds of thousands of uh, people use it, uh, then I'll be a big bang for the work, work. However, we'll only take that if our solution is going to be markedly different and better because of the use of the uh, technologies and techniques that we know. Things you see in the middle here, um, uh, the capabilities that we have, that we are uh, either you know, 
in some of the cases world class uh, because this is necessary for my students and researchers to work and uh, you know progress in their own uh, you know uh, things they are computer science and uh, ai students and uh, they need to develop advanced the techniques and um, example is that in the context of uh, mental health uh, there aren't uh, many people who are able to explain and there is practically none that we know of that who are able to support the safety and our use of this so-called knowledge infused learning technique uh, is uh, promises to indeed do just that. The, uh, the uh, collaborator needs to um, be able to provide access to enough of the data, either patient population, or they already collected data that we can use. For example, with the, um, uh, you know, uh, with the people who do neuroimaging, uh, uh, they have collected, and instead of mind and brain, they have collected neuroimaging data for 10,000 patients. So now in this case, um, us to test our AI techniques, and uh, they, they, they have to also work with us very closely to give us domain knowledge. We are not clinic expert in clinical part of it. So the formulation of the questions, or the, you know, uh, I show briefly, showed briefly that MBC AI video and the questions that were created, these were all created in collaboration with our, uh, you know, collaborators at ABC. So, um, uh, the, the, the strong um, engagement with the access to data and um, uh, expertise has to be necessary. And the second is that there has to be funding. Uh, now, uh, with the funding is that uh, uh, we don't have to have funding um, in the sense of, um, you know, in many of the things that we do, particularly in NICE work, has to have done preliminary work, preliminary work and have the result. So we are fully um, capable of investing with our collaborator the necessary time to do collaborate, you know, uh, the work, but there must be commitment to then follow through to write the R01 grants or uh, whatever, uh, you know, applications that we're going to pursue, such that over the period of, uh, you know, I, in many of these uh, preliminary work, um, we are spending substantial amount of time and effort. If I'm spending one student a year worth of effort, I'm spending $50,000. Where do I get that $50,000 from? So, you know, I, I, we hope that half of those uh, things actually lead to um, uh, funded projects so that in some sense, indirectly we recoup that investment when we have uh, uh, followed work. Uh, typically, uh, the projects in uh, the project that we do in the clinical domain uh, are uh, ones that lead to MPI, multi-PI, uh, joint PI uh, funding, where uh, one faculty from the clinical side and uh, one or more faculty from clinical side and uh, well, at least one faculty from the AI side are co-PIs, and um, there is substantial, uh, you know, there is fund funding for both the sides. Uh, we do not want to see be seen as um, uh, uh, cheap developers of, of tools and techniques. We want to be see, seen as research partners that will break new grounds in uh, solutions. And um, so, so I think that's how we, we pursue this. Thank you. That's very helpful to know some of the practical situations um, in which you in which your collaborations will will thrive. Let me wait for faculty to ask questions. Okay, looks like... Um... Oh, no, I have one quick question. Um, you had said we could have access to your presentation. Yes. Um, I would like that, please. Um, sure. What's the best way? Uh, well, I'm just going to give you now. Um, 
So here is the, uh, I'm going to put the link in the chat and you can uh, click on it and make sure it opens for you. It does, thank you. <sighs> Yeah, you can put in the slideshow mode and then uh, uh, click on the videos and you'll be able to do that. Uh, or you can also play the video from YouTube uh, just in case the voices won't play if you're in the slides. Anything else? Amit, can you send us some links to some of these presentations because we can have them included in the uh, uh, newsletter that we send every Friday to all of our faculty. Yeah. Uh, to I have the, the link to presentations right here that I shared. Um, there are um, there are, you know the provide the links to a specific. Um, for example, three or four of the videos and the project pages, if they want to sample what the projects look like. Otherwise, they're all in here. This, this okay, got it. Okay. I got it. That's good. Yeah. Okay, no worries. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, unless there's anything else. Uh, let, let me see if, if um, other faculty have any questions. Uh, many of you all, I think, have been provided a lot of food for thought from Dr. Shedd's presentations. He covered so many different areas. And you want to maybe think carefully about how that might uh, help your particular focus, whether it be a particular disease condition or a particular population. Um, any any questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, hearing from none. Dr. Shet, thank you so much for joining us. Kristen, do your video just came on? Did you have a question? I don't have a question. I just thank you for the presentation. I just okay. wanted to wave goodbye okay. and say thank you. Okay, no no worries. So thank you so much, Amit, for sharing us uh, sharing your uh, the breadth of knowledge and the breadth of work that you all are doing. It's amazing. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure after people have some time to think about things, you might uh, have people contacting you. And that's what we are hoping to build uh, as, as, as research partners. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Cindy, I think you wanted to speak to me, so you can stay on if you'd like. OK. Yeah. Um... <laughs> H hang on, Cindy. Let me stop recording. Oh, good idea. <laughs> uh, if I can figure out where.